Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day, subscribe and click the bell. A warm breeze was blowing through the open balcony windows, and the full moon illuminated the entire space. Vanessa was sitting on a small warm blanket, and her eyes filled with tears. It had been exactly one month since her young husband had left her. Not even a day had passed since their wedding, and she had already discovered that her new hubby had managed to get a mistress before they were married. O was sitting gazing at the moon spots, the full moon clearly visible tonight, and she was holding a photograph in her hands, the same photograph from her wedding. Vanessa seemed to have already melted into that photo, for she had never been separated from it since her divorce. She looked at the photo again with tear-filled eyes, and the tears welled up again. So happy, so beautiful. Who would have told her that it would all end like this, or that she would catch her spouse for treason? Just on her wedding day, the young man was hotly kissing another, hiding with her in the gentleman's room of the restaurant, where the wedding feast was being held. More importantly, he was not only kissing a stranger. She was kissing Vanessa's best friend, the friend Vanessa had offered to be a witness at her wedding. The friend Vanessa was proud to call her best and closest friend. She looked at Luna again. Contemplating the image of herself and her former lover was beyond her. Of course, when Andrew, Vanessa's husband, was caught red-handed, she began to recant. It was all her. She did not want to hang around my neck until the end. Even in the gentleman she came. Screaming young man. Screaming in her heart. Screaming. So there was no doubt in the mind of the young lady. Probably not her fault. It was all her. She had seduced him. Naively thought Vanessa and, of course, forgave him. The wedding took place. And it never crossed none of the guests' minds that there was a third person lurking in the newlyweds' relationship. A happy family life never came together. After only five days, Andrew confessed his passion for another woman and asked for a divorce. Why did he marry me? Vanessa kept repeating the question over and over again. Why did he have to marry me? Why did he lie that it wasn't his fault? Was there an answer to these questions, or would she never find one? She rose from her chair and leaned against the windowsill, breathing in the cool night air. He put his hand to his chest. She wore a pendant around her neck. It was a pendant Andrew had given her before they were married. She touched the jewel and smiled involuntarily through her tears. Maybe all was not yet lost, she thought. After all, he never took his gift from me. The pendant had its own story, interesting and even frightening. Andrew had inherited it from his great-grandmother. The large diamond pendant was worth an unprecedented amount of money. Andrew's great-grandmother managed to save it during the Civil War. The Andrew family came from a maternal line of nobles, and this pendant was the only thing that reminded her of her relative's former wealth, although his relatives could have sold it long ago. Perhaps the proceeds could have been used to buy a couple of apartments in the city center. But Andrew and his parents respected their roots, as these jewels were inherited only by women. Andrew's mother insisted that the pendant pass into her hands. At their wedding, the young people had maintained a friendly and then closer relationship for many years, since adolescence. No one doubted their love for each other. Or was she spinning a jewel between their hands? The image of Andrew immediately surfaced in the memories. What a dear favorite, she thought wistfully for the umpteenth time. How could he do this to me? In the girl's head did not fit everything that had happened. She didn't understand why he had left her and why she had left with her best friend. Kelly had been Vanessa's best friend since kindergarten. The girls grew up together, developed together, and even the parents of the boys' girlfriends were friends with each other. Kelly had watched Vanessa and Andrew's relationship begin. She had seen how they had fallen in love, how they had dreamed of getting married and having children. Why had she had her eye on him? After all, there had always been plenty of men around. The double betrayal was harder to bear than it might seem at first glance. After her short-lived marriage and hasty divorce, Vanessa had lost herself. She had lost everything she held so dear. Still so young, she didn't know how to move on, how to learn to trust someone again. She let go of the pendant. She looked at the photo again. Her eyes glistened with tears again. Or was she about to throw herself back on the bed, choking back sobs? After all, for the entire month since her divorce, 
All she had been able to do was cry. She stepped out onto the balcony and headed for her room when suddenly the doorbell rang loudly. And not just any doorbell, it was literally crowded. Vanessa looked at the clock, which read exactly two o'clock. Her heart pounded to the beat of the knocking on the door. Her head suddenly ached from the unexpected and annoying sobriety of the call. Maria, the girl's mother, peeked into the parents' room. Or what was wrong? Are you sleepy? She asked. Tie your robe. The woman yawned. In truth, the frozen fear in her eyes betrayed excitement. Who was it? Who could it have come to this? Andrew? Vanessa exclaimed, without calling my mother to finish the sentence. She was bouncing in place like a little girl getting a new toy. E, interrupted by the insistent three chimes of the doorbell. It's Andrew. He's come to make amends. I knew it. I knew this would happen. Mary flinched as she heard another knock on the door. She lowered her voice, looked puzzled at her daughter Vanessa. Shut up. What, Andrew? He has a new love now. Forget it, please. Once again, she couldn't finish the sentence. The insistent ringing of the doorbell and the pounding of fists on the door were terrifying. The woman became entangled in her robe, her hands trembling with fear. She grabbed her daughter's hand without opening it. We don't know who it is. It's Andrew, cried Vanessa, coming back from her mother's arms. She ran to the door, not letting go of the photograph from her hands at her mother's screams. She, without even looking through the peephole, hurried to open the door insistently for that visitor who was flying by. The girl, contemplating the face of the man who had arrived, her hands trembled with renewed vigor. When she realized that another person had arrived, the man entered the apartment with a confident stride. He was followed by three other strangers or males and three neighbors known to the family on the landing. The first man squared his shoulders, reached into his pockets and shoved a square of cardboard in the girl's face. Vanessa here lives the operative, Police Captain Benjamin. He opened a booklet confirming his identity. I have a warrant to search your apartment. Vanessa was speechless. She looked at the people who had come to see her. What exactly was going on? The girl didn't understand. Maria immediately stood behind her back. What was wrong with her? Worried? Asked the woman. On what grounds do you want to search us? The man smiled and put a document in the hands of Vanessa's mother. The woman looked at it quickly. Then she looked at Vanessa's daughter. It says here that you are a thief. She barely spoke in a voice that Vanessa seemed on the verge of fainting. She's a thief. She has to be. There must be some mistake. As the young woman tried to come to herself and realize exactly what she might be guilty of, the men entered unceremoniously. Starting to turn everything upside down, they covered everything. Shelf after shelf and drawer after drawer were opened, shaking and tossing books. They trampled dirty boots, shields, carpets. With absolutely no regard for any standards of decency, they shamelessly opened cupboards and overturned and threw all their contents on the floor. Even the fridge was carelessly tossed, with perfectly good, fresh food on the floor. Vanessa didn't know what to think. Every once in a while she tried to catch her mother's eye, but she looked away, then looked questioningly at her neighbor. Then she looked questioningly at her neighbor. Maybe she could explain something to her. The neighbor? The kindly old woman in her sixties nodded and walked a couple of steps away. Ovalichko began the old woman in a whisper. How can that be? You're a good girl, but why do you need that jewel? Vanessa narrowed her eyes. What are you talking about? I don't understand anything. I'm so nervous. What's going on? The neighbor opened her mouth but didn't have time to say anything. I understand, shouted the man who had come in. It is necessary. The old woman nodded and returned to the company. Or was she thinking about jewelry? She, like her mother, continued to dutifully follow the search. Watching in horror at the mess, they were making when they had already rummaged through almost the entire floor and obviously hadn't found anything worthwhile. Vanessa raised a shaky voice. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? I didn't steal or anything. She said, trying to silence the trembling in her voice. Where are the jewels? Citizen Vanessa? Asked one of the agents, looking sternly into the girl's eyes. He seemed to be trying to read something in them. 
he averted his gaze to Vanessa's mother. He looked at her judiciously. Maria, aren't you ashamed of yourself for raising a thief? She asked defiantly. From indignation, the woman lost the power of speech and stammered. Yes, yes you. I would never do that. She repeated reaching with her voice. Vanessa smiled to herself, noting with amazement. He is an excellent psychologist. She looked at her mother again and realized bitterly that she could not be expected to support her. Maria was the kind of person who valued public opinion more than anything else in the world. And when she learned that her daughter might be a thief, she literally turned green. If Vanessa turned out to be a crook, her mother would have no problem giving her up. Why would I want a daughter like that? Aloud, Maria kept making excuses. I raised her to be a good and kind person. I didn't teach her to steal, it's not my fault. She's completely crazy, with her Andres, she shouted. Vanessa unconsciously looked at the photograph she still held in her hand. This action immediately attracted the attention of the policeman. What is this? Asked Captain Benjamin, stepping forward. He abruptly snatched the photograph from her hands. Vanessa was stunned. She couldn't remember herself without the photo. The captain looked at the photo and then looked carefully into the girl's eyes. What do you want pictures of this man for? He asked sternly. Do you wish him harm? His gaze swept over Vanessa's face. He is my husband, she shouted, holding her hands to her chest, as if instinctively defending herself from the unexpected aggression. The ex is your ex-husband. The policeman corrected her. How did he suddenly catch a glimpse of the girl's neck? He shouted and pulled her hand towards the frightened Vanessa. You haven't had time to resent it. She is the man ripped off the pendant with a sharp movement, tearing the chain around her neck. He raised his hand victoriously with the pendant. I found it, he shouted victoriously. Let the witnesses record it. Have you seen it all? The people concerned nodded their heads and Vanessa's mother squeezed her heart. The man looked at Vanessa critically. I thought you were smarter to at least hide it. I would have guessed it was stolen merchandise. And you? She turned around and waved her hand at him. Stupid. Or did the protesters wave their hands? No, no, no. This pendant was given to Andrew by my husband. Ask him, his mother. Ask him. She screamed, and shame on her for lying. One of the policemen spoke up. This pendant belongs to Kelly. According to our records, she's currently Andrew's fiancé. Did you steal it? Captain Benjamin looked menacingly at his employee. He was silent for a moment. Benjamin muttered in a muffled tone turning to Vanessa and mechanically repeating endless sentences. Citizen Vanessa, you are a suspect in a grand theft case. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. You have the right to an attorney. In the absence of an attorney, you will be provided with a public defender. Be prepared. You must follow us to the investigation department. Bring your passport, a change of underwear and personal hygiene items. You may bring your own cup and spoon. Everything else will be given to you by your relatives according to the approved list of things authorized for transfer. Hurry up, he added in another harsh, arrogant tone. He elbowed poor Vanessa in the back. Two minutes to get ready. She had no choice but to do as she was told. It was like a blur. One last look at her mother. Mom screamed under her breath and I did it. You know it wasn't my fault. Maria, she lifted her chin. You're not my daughter anymore, she said in a cold, judgmental tone. It was at that moment that Vanessa realized that from now on she was on her own. This was how she had been sent to jail for nothing. It turned out that Kelly had been her best friend. Vanessa filed a complaint against her. And not only did she file a complaint, she had to provide irrefutable proof of the embezzlement. As it was written by the police and then in court, Kelly, without batting an eyelash, claimed that Vanessa had allegedly blatantly stolen the very expensive pendant, or incidentally, a pendant given to her by her everyday husband. Kelly charged that the pendant had allegedly come to her as a gift following the dissolution of Vanessa and Andrew's marriage. And Vanessa went to the friend's apartment, made a fuss and, taking advantage of the general commotion, made off with valuable jewelry. As proof of the separation brought a video in which Vanessa entered the apartment of the best friend. 
nothing would have happened. But that day, Kelly herself called Vanessa at her apartment. They were still friends, or not. In any case, Vanessa had already suffered a terrible double betrayal and had been brutally framed. Basely and shabbily framed by those she trusted the most in the world. The girl had no money for a lawyer. After all, her mother, as well as the rest of the family, had abandoned Vanessa. They seemed to have forgotten about her once and for all. They decided that the criminal could no longer be their relative. So they had no problem cutting the poor girl out of their lives. And Vanessa was left alone abandoned, betrayed, unwanted by the lawyer provided by the state. He didn't do his job, and Vanessa was sentenced to six years in a minimum security penal colony. In court she tried to justify herself, tried to prove her innocence, but all to no avail. During endless proceedings the judge would not even listen to her. And in the case there was more than enough evidence against her. Somehow another proof of her guilt appeared. An unknown witness of Vanessa's had appeared who had seen her running away from the stolen pendant all the way home. How was it possible to realize that a person was running with a small stolen piece of jewelry? How could one realize that it was stolen, if you don't even see the jewelry? In short, Vanessa had suffered a crushing defeat. Jail was not something she could avoid. At the end of the trial, she was quickly transferred from the remand center to a colony not far from her hometown. Vanessa had no support, money or energy left for the rest of her life. When she learned of the final court decision, Vanessa realized that her existence had lost all meaning. Thoughts of suicide began to visit her unstoppably. However, she still managed to hold on to the desire to live. Vanessa had set herself a clear and important goal. To find out who the unknown witness was. To get out of here, find out and get revenge. Revenge on all those who had so cruelly and ruthlessly trampled on her life. In case that was worth finding out too. So you decided to live. What's wrong with you? Asked a large adult woman is sick. Then you need to go to the hospital. The woman stepped back, away from Vanessa. It was one of her cellmates. Fortunately, Vanessa had no problem in this scary community. What was she so afraid of? Look, no Russian, in such a place you cannot show your weakness. Her new comrades told her. After hearing the story of the arrival of the newcomer, Vanessa answered the question about her well-being trying to put on the most friendly smile. I think I have poisoned myself a little. I think the porridge they gave us yesterday must have gone bad. How do you think you're feeling? I don't know. I'm all right, I guess, she said. Her name was Emily and she had been in prison for almost three years. In Vanessa, the woman could see her daughter for she was almost a lifetime older. As soon as this frail little girl appeared, Emily took her under her massive and she did not allow anyone to offend the newcomers. This tall, burly, red-haired woman was always helping the unfortunate. Of course, she was no match for them. After all, she had no knowledge of life in the colony. Emily herself was serving time under the same article as Vanessa for robbery. True, Emily committed her crime, and she wasn't ashamed of it at all. She once worked as a programmer and managed to hack into the bank account of a large company where she worked. All the stolen money Emily transferred to the account of one of the private orphanages. After all, she knew very well that the company made its profits completely illegally. However, law enforcement authorities failed to appreciate such an ability, and Emily was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Emily gave Vanessa a stern look. Maybe you're right, my stomach is used to this food. Yours is not yet so strong. It's true that she is pale and yellow-green, you should see a doctor. Honey, you should," repeated Vanessa. She had the last word. I'm getting worse and worse. Vanessa was taken for a medical examination. The doctor, after seeing the finished tests, came to Vanessa's room, very disturbed by the vision. He examined the patient and took another look at the sick list. Are you aware of what is happening to you? Asked the doctor in a concerned tone. How could you have missed something like this? Vanessa staggered out of the room. What's weak? She asked. I've been poisoned. I just have a weak stomach. Not in a harsh tone. Vanessa's doctor replied. Are you pregnant or did you just get out of the hospital bed? Colorful spots popped in my eyes. 
inside everything twisted with a new bout of nausea. From what? She immediately looked down at her stomach and wondered, how could she have missed something like that? Had a crazy idea crossed her mind? Or did she look questioningly at the doctor? Are you sure? Of course, the woman replied confidently. Do you even know who the father is? Vanessa was offended. Who does he think I am? Of course I know. I've only had one man my husband. But I'm not interested. When you give birth, you will give the children to the father, if there is one. Or already was, she wanted to start explaining to this disgruntled woman that she was divorced, and that in fact, the father of her future children had fraudulently put her in jail. For suddenly she almost fell off her bunk from astonishment and shock. Okay, stop, children. You mean yes, Vanessa replied in a calmly nonchalant tone. Are you expecting triplets? Vanessa's whole life seemed to flash before her eyes. She thought she was about to end her existence. Are you kidding? How is that possible? Crushed, she hugged herself and rocked, sitting up. Just a little more. And she's doing her voice. So already life is ruined. It's the worst. And then there's three kids. I could go and hang myself, honestly. I have nothing to do but joke with the prisoners. Not without squeamishness, the doctor replied. How can I get in touch with the father of her children? Vanessa, we are divorced, she replied. I don't think it's possible to give the children to him. And I don't want to. Aya, I'm going to have an abortion. You're not having an abortion here. The doctor told her matter-of-factly. You're going to give birth as a baby. You don't have to. They'll put you in an orphanage. A brutal November day. During the night, the prisoner Vanessa gave birth to three tiny, weak, premature babies in terrible agony. Immediately after the births, which took place in the colony's own internment center, they were separated from their mother and taken to a specialized maternity ward, which is part of the prison system of the penitentiary department of the Federal Penitentiary Service. To everyone's surprise, all three survived and returned to the colony where their mother was. Vanessa spent two weeks in the hospital. Valeria had a fever. No one needed her and with inflammation of the uterus, she was taken to another clinic. When it became clear that her case was a disaster, helped all the same Emily, who raised a terrible fuss, threatening to pass through his lawyer to the appropriate complaint about the conditions of detention of sick prisoners. Having come to her senses after the operation, which she had undergone urgently Vanessa reconsidered its attitude to these children and did not write an application for their abandonment. Understand, you will never have the opportunity to have your own children again. She was convinced by another doctor, kind and considerate, unlike the one who had been indifferent and dismissive to Vanessa and the colony. Think about it. Life is unpredictable. One day it's black, the next day it's clear, and you won't have other children. But how will I raise them? Vanessa cried. I have nothing else. Even my own mother abandoned me, and you say that's a plus. It's up to you. The doctor shook her head. But if I were you, I wouldn't be so quick to dismiss it when Vanessa and her children are finally strong enough to be discharged from the clinic. The same doctor arranged for them to meet. After seeing her daughters, she had three beautiful babies. Or she just couldn't give them up and burst into tears again seeing how tiny, wonderful, and helpless they were. Gritting her teeth, she decided she would get through it somehow. Don't worry, Emily told her when they saw each other again at the colony. You're the mother of many children now. You'll be released early and you'll get all kinds of benefits from the state. And I won't leave you. I'm in love with you, you fool. She turned away, trying to hide her eyes from them. We'll figure it out. Vanessa hugged her older friend gratefully her throat constricted in spasms, preventing her from uttering words of thanks. Of course, the children were housed separately in a room specially designated for such occasions. Their all babies born in the colony were raised with state resources, as in orphanages. Mothers were given a certain amount of time each day to feed the children and interact with them. Vanessa, who survived a difficult birth and subsequent operation, had no milk but she gave her cats all the tenderness she had lost more than once. The oldest of her sisters, the firstborn, Vanessa named Emily after her cellmate and new friend Helen. She had always liked that name. Long ago, as in another life, when she was still with Andrew, they had dreamed of naming their daughter Helen. 
Vanessa named her third daughter Betty, after Andrew's mother. Vanessa and her mother-in-law had always had a very good relationship. She had a much kinder disposition than Vanessa's mother. And she always showed her future daughter-in-law a touching concern for her. Although Vanessa had no proof that Betty was not implicated in the story of her unjust accusation, somehow she knew for certain that Andrew's mother had had nothing to do with it. Unconscious, weak, based on nothing. But such a nice feeling nestled in the soul of the young mom she knew. She was safe, kind. Betty couldn't have done that to her. Or she could have, flipping the gruesome story back and forth. Vanessa changed her mind every few days. It all seemed so strange. Time passed, the days dragged on and on, slowly and painfully. Vanessa did not have the most serious article. And the general regime colonies are a much less harsh place than the Strodacha as the old inmates used to say. But this unjust imprisonment in the colony, it seemed to her a real hard work. Or he counted the days and even hours, dreaming that he would finally get out of prison and could breathe fresh and such a smell of freedom. Worn behind bars, the children, strangely enough, gave Vanessa a gift. A new hope gave her a will to live, a will to develop, to make their lives better and more worthy than hers. She was well aware that she could hardly find a decent job because of her criminal past, but she knew that for the sake of her children she had to cling to this life tooth and claw. Vanessa often thought of her own mother with tears in her eyes. She kept wondering how her mother had been able to abandon her so easily when she herself had become a mother. The questions for Maria came even more, or she didn't understand how she could do that to her children. After the birth of the babies, life seemed to shine with new colors, despite all the negativity and blackness her day-to-day -day life had become. Now Vanessa was waking up with no tears in her eyes. She had set a new goal, she had found a new meaning to her life. Now the young woman had two constant goals, to raise her children and, of course, to take revenge on her abusers. You have talent, said Emily with admiration in her voice. She watched Vanessa's work with interest. The women worked together cutting and sewing. And if Emily did her work rather mechanically, without any interest in the work, the latter was fully involved in the labor process. Thank you, the girl replied. Embarrassed. I like it too. I like the way it looks. I never thought sewing could be so interesting. You're the only one who thinks so, Emily replied. With a quick glance at the rest of the workshop, you see how good it is in prison. You've done what you love and found it, said the woman with a smile on her face, or a frown. You can say either way. You're right though. Vanessa would enjoy being a partner. In her normal life, she never thought working with her hands could be so satisfying, especially after a prison sentence. Studying in high school was out of the question. Vanessa, at her mother's insistence, enrolled in college right out of high school, the girl never liked the major she'd have chosen. No wonder, because her future profession was not chosen by her, but by her mother. Vanessa entered the law school and studied there for the first two years. True, as it turned out, the knowledge she acquired did not help her avoid dishonest imprisonment, and she was never really attracted to it. Prospects of becoming a lawyer Vanessa was more attracted to some freer creative professions. Already at the age of five, the girl expressed her desire to become a fashion designer, and if the father or supported his daughter, the mother rudely ridiculed her dream. Years later, Vanessa realized that there was no point in arguing with Maria, and there was no support in the form of a father. The girl's parents divorced when she was 10 years old. Unfortunately, she had to give up her own dreams and obey her authoritarian parents. Education cost her a lot, but Maria was adamant Either you study where I tell you, or you are not my daughter, she shouted. It's funny, but now Vanessa was completely free to choose her own path. Her mother had given up on her anyway. A pity, of course. She had to endure the restriction of that very freedom under such harsh and even unbearable conditions to be free to choose. Or maybe it was her parents again. He realized for the first time that Maria had always been a kind of unloving, unloving woman who did not give her own daughter the attention she deserved. She was an overbearing, unscrupulous woman. And Vanessa, upon reflection, finally realized that her mother's actions were more than expected. And Vanessa's father was also a rather peculiar man. 
Hey, Vanessa. Emily planted herself right in front of the girl, waving her palm in front of her face. I said, have you applied for parole yet? Eh? Ah, yes, Vanessa replied. Slowly coming back to reality. Right after Vanessa gave birth to her children, Emily gave her the great idea to apply for parole and try to shorten her sentence by having three children, as well as good behavior and productive work. I didn't even have time to tell you, Vanessa said guiltily. The administration came to see me recently and offered me this option. If all goes well, I'll be able to complete only a third of the entire course. And Vanessa put aside the jacket, to which previously lazily reached the zipper. And she looked carefully at her friend. What now? She asked. How am I supposed to go on living? Emily glared at her. What do you mean, how are you supposed to go on living? She laughed lightly. You're so young, what's wrong with your head? Oh hunched her shoulders. Where am I going to go? I have no one left. I'm alone with three children. I have nowhere to take them. Come on. Emily shook her head patronizingly. Do you really think your mother won't take you back? So if you did your time. What's the big deal? A mother always takes her child back. Yes, girls. Emily looked questioningly at the other inmates. Of course she will, of course she will. I would love my daughter even if she killed someone. Another person's voice was heard. Vanessa shook her head. No, you don't know my mother. I don't think I can accept the rabbit's daughter. It's okay, it's okay, said Emily, conciliatory, with her hands in the air. But your dad, where is he? Vanessa wondered again. She hadn't seen her father since her parents divorced. At first she had pounced on him, demanding that her mother let her talk to her father. But she always refused. He doesn't need you, Maria kept repeating. Over time, Vanessa got used to the idea that she couldn't maintain a relationship with her father. No, he doesn't care about me either, she said sadly. Emily rubbed her chin thoughtfully. Well, and the father of your children for no reason. In a curt tone, the girl replied he set me up. All right, all right, calm down. Emily laughed, then we'll have to figure out how to get back at him. Vanessa was slowly but steadily approaching her target. It seemed that the starting point she needed was very close. Vanessa could breathe. The fresh smell of freedom was very welcome. The girl was well behaved, probably even perfectly better than most of the young women in the colony. She had never smoked in her life and had never been in conflict with other inmates. She always complied with all the demands of the administration with courtesy and compliance. She complied perfectly and even over complied with the work rule. Vanessa was already one year and eight months old. Her daughters were growing up. Vanessa's sewing skills continued to develop at an accelerated pace. Sometimes strange and even frightening thoughts would come to her mind. From time to time, Vanessa realized that she felt much better in prison than at home. Here she had made real, loyal friends. Here she saw her children for the first time, kissed each of her daughters for the first time, breathed in the smells of their little bodies for the first time. Here he could finally do something he really loved. Here she was able to realize many things, less and less often. Vanessa thought wistfully of Andrew. Of course, she was still choked with resentment, but not with such a terrible and overflowing force. Time passed, and she could think of him without tears in her eyes. But one of the questions that had tormented her remained unanswered. Why did he do this to me, she thought. Why did he want me to go to jail? She didn't understand her ex-husband's purpose. His reasons for doing something so despicable to her. And Kelly, what was she missing? Why would he do something so despicable to someone so close to her? Vanessa couldn't let the situation go. Not only couldn't, she didn't want to. Her thirst for revenge was growing. Her gaze a red, throbbing veil. When she thought of how she would take revenge on her assailants, her blood ran cold in her veins, and her heart pounded, as if some happy event was coming very soon. Thoughts of revenge gave him strength. They illuminated her thorny path. Why were you asking or turning your head sideways? Don't you want to get out of here? My girl Emily stretched out her arms as usual. Of course, I want to get out of here, but I have slightly different circumstances. What are those circumstances? Vanessa looked slyly at her friend. Do you have any secrets from me? Emily laughed. She's too little for that kind of talk. We'll talk about it later. 
how can I be away without you? Vanessa asked sadly, changing her playful tone. I wish, I wish we could go out together. I wish we could be together. It's not over yet, honey, Emily said good-naturedly, pulling out a good cigarette from somewhere. We'll have it all. It had been almost two years since Vanessa had been transferred to the correctional facility, and she had begun serving her sentence thanks to her good behavior and the excellent recommendations of the prison authorities. Or was she on parole? She had served exactly one-third of her original sentence. Considering her stay in the detention center, sometimes Vanessa would think how fortunate she was to have had her stay in a not-at-all-pleasant place so significantly shortened. However, then she would quickly come back to the reality of this term, and it was not to be with anger. The girl thought, for Vanessa was not at all sure that there was still a place for her in this world, let alone a place for her daughters. For now the girls had to be left at the colony. There was such an opportunity for a short time. Vanessa said goodbye to her daughters with tears in her eyes. It was unbearably painful for her to leave them. But there was no other option. They simply had nowhere to go together. When she finally emerged from the barbed wire of the compound, outside it was burning frost itself. She took a deep breath of the cool, frosty air. It seemed strikingly different here in the wilderness than it had been outside the colony walls. Nonsense, certainly, Vanessa said aloud and smiled at the comparison. Taking a deep breath, her nose felt protected from the cold. She had dreamed of this moment so much. She had imagined it so many times, she had counted the minutes until she was free. And here I am, Vanessa thought. But much to her regret, the first few minutes of freedom did not bring her adequate pleasure. The young mother was still worried about her children. How are they doing without me, are they okay? Vanessa looked again at the high walls of her recent prison, where she had spent the last two years of her life. Her hands trembled treacherously. Her head was pounding. What awaits us, she wondered. Finally, summoning up his courage, he climbed up the authentic, narrow, clear, snow-covered path. Her first destination was the bus stop, from where Vanessa was going to return to her hometown, as she had no other options left. At Emily's insistence, she decided to talk to her mother again. If she could forgive her for something she had not done. And Vanessa, proudly turning her chin, headed resolutely towards the agreed place. The bus, full of silent and very sullen people, had already crossed the city line. Vanessa held her breath. How has everything changed here, she thought, looking anxiously out the window. She wiped herself from time to time. The glass in her palm was sweating with excitement. She watched the faces of the citizens, looked with interest at the buildings flying by, looked at the city as if she was doing it for the first time. The bus had already entered downtown, and Vanessa gasped with joy. Christmas was coming, and everything was decorated with big bright garlands, LED lights, and big milky toys. The city was brimming with twinkling lights. It was bustling and cheerful. It revealed to the ex-convict her solemn side. Vanessa couldn't contain her emotions. Is it so beautiful? She commented aloud. Shut up, she whispered to a woman sitting behind her, and you're not allowed to sleep here. Vanessa was immediately embarrassed tucked her head between her shoulders and fixed her gaze on the window. The bus was stuck in a small traffic jam, and she had a good opportunity to look out the windows of the cars next to her. In each of them there was someone sitting, whether it was a driver alone, a husband and wife, a mother and daughter, children in the back seat. Happy families were on their way somewhere, rushing to buy everything they needed for the upcoming New Year's Eve. O was so engrossed in her simple task that a sudden sharp, continuous sound made her jump in the seat. Her heart beat with renewed vigor. Her mind immediately began to replay memories of the day the unfortunate woman had been held in her mother's apartment. She looked toward the car. With what, involuntary alarm? She asked aloud. Good heavens, replied the woman sitting behind her. Calm down, it's just a car honking. A wedding is a wedding. Vanessa looked out the window with renewed interest. Happy people she thought, trying to calm her racing heart. And she began to search with her eyes for the wedding procession. Finally, the traffic jam cleared and Vanessa saw a cavalcade of expensive white cars decorated with various bridal paraphernalia passing by. What was the strength of the others? Running forward, a smile froze on her face. 
an ex-convict not long ago, and herself the same. She headed toward the succession of cars that continually signaled her own wedding with a mixture of interest and sadness. She watched the cars go by until she saw the main one. The procession was circling the newlyweds' car when the celebrants in a long white limousine, decorated with silver roses with warriors, branches and rings with a bell, matched the bus, Vanessa's mouth dropped open in amazement. It was the same car she and Andrew had ridden in for their wedding. She took a quick glance at the memorized number combination of three eights, dispelling any last doubts. What a coincidence, Vanessa thought. And then she saw him blink. One second, one blink. But to the woman it seemed like that very instant. It lasted an eternity. Time stretched out like chewing gum. The newlywed's car seemed to take forever to overtake the bus. And behind the wheel, Vanessa managed to make out Andrew, handsome and smiling, dressed in a luxurious suit. It was definitely him. He had always loved to drive and had been behind the wheel at his first wedding. And this time he made no exception. And next to him Kelly in a lush white wedding gown, deep neckline, fur cape, shiny uncle in her hair. Or it seemed that their gazes met and Andrew noticed her. She thought he had caught her gaze and looked at her as he had once looked at her long, long ago. Vanessa wasn't sure she hadn't imagined that look, but she wanted so badly to believe it. She wanted to feel that he hadn't forgotten her. As if in slow motion, the moment of their meeting poured all thick golden honey over an invisible plate of memories, a shake of the head or the realization that warm feelings for her former fiancé had migrated into a thirst for revenge. The feelings and Vanessa seemed to flare up with renewed vigor. It even seemed to her that Andrew was looking at her with his former warmth. Was he even looking at her? She clutched her head and a throbbing pain settled in her temples. What's the matter, child? A worried voice was heard. A woman who had been sitting behind her got up from her seat and approached her. Or was she still holding her head, looking at her feet? I'm fine. Her head is spinning. She squeezed out a heartbeat. Hers cleared. Her head was spinning more and more. He tried to lift it up, but to no avail. On top of everything else, he also felt nauseous. Calm down. You're having a panic attack. Take a deep breath. Look at me in a calm, reassuring voice, the woman told her. Vanessa had time to think that the voice sounded familiar. And then Betty and Betty looked at her. The woman held out her hands in surprise. And Betty, it's you. I didn't recognize you. Yes. Vanessa was in complete shock. Standing in front of her was her failed mother-in-law. Andrew's mother. She looked at her former relative. How she had changed, Vanessa thought in the more than two years since they had seen each other. Betty seemed to have aged about 10 years. Tired eyes down to the ground and cheeks. Deep wrinkles. What's the matter, are you like this? The girl spoke softly, still holding her head in her hands. Oh, Vanessa, what has become of you? The woman asked, ignoring the question. She must have been thinking the same thing as Vanessa herself. Indeed, she had changed a lot. Prison leaves its mark on everyone. I just got out of juvie today, or shoulder opening. The dizziness disappeared and the resentment and thirst for revenge returned to my heart. I was in jail. With defiance, I said. Because of your son, because of you. You were the one who insisted I have the pendant. Why did you do it, Vanessa? The woman quickly interrupted her. I know I just couldn't change anything. Yes, she laughed derisively. Then why didn't you testify in court? Do you realize what you've done? Her anger began to rise with renewed vigor. Why are you doing this to me? Betty, guilty, lowered her eyes. I understand. Poor, poor girl. She put a hand on Vanessa's shoulder, but she pulled away abruptly. Take care of yourself. Don't trust anyone. With those words, Andrew's mother turned and headed for the bus doors. Or did she? And you're leaving like that, she shrieked, paying no attention to the other passengers. Without explaining herself, she suddenly fell silent, realizing that she had missed some important detail. Wait, this bus, it's only coming from the colony. What were you doing in the colony? Stuck? Asked Vanessa, not trusting anyone. The woman repeated her words and got off. The doors closed and the bus continued on its way. Vanessa didn't have time to get off after she looked around. 
Betty had been in the wrong neighborhood. Where was she from and why was she so different? A sharp rise from her seat made the girl sit back in her chair. Her head was spinning again, nausea creeping up her throat. What the hell is going on, she wondered. But she no longer had the energy to search for an answer. After a couple more stops, a worried Vanessa got out and headed in the direction of her mother's house. She walked through the door and upstairs. A feeling of nostalgia came over her with renewed vigor. It seemed as if the last two years had never passed. Vanessa had just run out to the store. And now she was returning home, to the apartment where she had lived most of her life. She stood in front of the door for a few more minutes, shifting from one foot to the other, unable to press the doorbell. Finally, he gathered his strength and rang the doorbell. A second time, a third. When I rang for the tenth time, in desperation, I thought, why won't he open the door? Where am I going to spend the night? And I started pounding on the door with my hands and feet, hoping my mother would open it for me. I am her daughter. I will prove that I am not a thief. She thought and knocked on the door for the last time, when she realized that no one would open the door. Vanessa slowly settled herself by the front door. She didn't know how long she sat there. She lost track of time, but she heard the elevator doors open. And there she was. Maria approached the door with a business-like air until she realized that Vanessa was sitting on the floor, dead, lost, dressed in old, tattered clothes. The young woman's skin had thickened her eyes had become harder, and her whole appearance denoted wariness and weariness. In two years, Vanessa had begun to look much older. Mary, on the other hand, had blossomed. The woman looked younger. She wore an elegant baggy coat over her shoulders. The skin on her face had stretched and her hands glistened with large expensive jewels. Mama, said Vanessa in a low voice. It was you, Maria, who faltered and with a sharp movement she corrected her fur coat. Girl, I don't know you, she blurted out suddenly. Mama, Mom, what are you doing? It's me, stammered Vanessa. She got up from her seat and held out her hands to her mother. She abruptly removed her palm from her horse. You want me to talk to bums too? She shouted and got out of here, I'll sleep somewhere else. If not, I'll call the police. Vanessa poked her nose out, yes, but call them. I think you've forgotten that I also reside here. With a challenge in her voice, the girl said. Maria smiled slyly. Only I am registered in my apartment. I am out of here. She thrust her hip at her daughter and began to unlock the apartment with the key. Mom, it's me. It's your daughter. I don't have any children. The woman replied coldly. She opened the door and rushed inside. A huge iron door slammed shut literally in front of Vanessa's nose, with blood in her veins. The former detainee froze. Of course, she had thought of all sorts of scenarios. She imagined her mother insulting her, yelling at her, calling her a criminal, demanding an explanation. But what would it be? Vanessa was in shock. Did her mother really not recognize her? Still trying to get home, she pounded her fists on the door again. Open up, she shouted. With all her might, or she knew perfectly well how much her mother cared about her reputation, especially in front of the neighbors. She knew she would not allow her name to be slandered in any way. Vanessa kept banging on the door and thinking to herself, but either let me in, or she'll call the real police. I don't care. I am a resident here, I have a right to be here. The door finally opened again. Get out of here, I've already called the police, said the woman holding on to the door with her hands. I looked inside the apartment and was shocked. No doubt it had been renovated. Everything so luxurious, so beautiful. The hallway is finished with decorative plaster smothered in mirrors and various interior tidbits. Mom, what's going on? Where did you get the money for such a renovation? Asked Vanessa in surprise. None of your business. Get out of here. Maria shouted, peering through the narrow gap between the wall and the chain-locked door. Where am I supposed to go? Where? You know I'm not home anymore. Go back the way you came, the woman chattered. That's it. Wait for the police. She screamed and slammed the door shut. She almost pinched her daughter's arm. What monster? Vanessa began to boil like the cauldron, when again there was the sound of the elevator opening and the district police officer appeared. What is going on here? The formidable man rubbed his stubble and chin. 
girl, leave the place. This is my house. I'm not going anywhere, Vanessa said firmly, crossing her arms over her chest. I'm registered here. That's right. But now we'll figure it all out. With those words, she disappeared through Maria's doors. As much as Vanessa wanted to, they wouldn't let her in. About 10 minutes passed. Vanessa was crouched on the stairs in expectation. Finally, the neighborhood agent came out of the apartment and headed toward her. Embarrassed, he ran his hand through Vanessa's sparse blonde hair, I guess, he clarified. Yes, let me go home. I have nowhere to sleep tonight, Vanessa replied indignantly. There's the thing. He cleared his throat and looked away, as if ashamed of what he was about to say. Have you been discharged from this floor? I'm sorry, but by law you have no right to be here. You have to leave. To which Vanessa stretched indignantly. But how? Is she my own mother, my own apartment? Yes, honestly I was surprised too, I admit it. She furrowed her brow. I'm really sorry, but you better go. But go where? I've got nowhere to go. Vanessa whispered, trying to shake off the coma that had crept up her throat. The policeman called the elevator. When he arrived, he waved them in, inviting the girl to follow him. Come on, I'll help you. Vanessa made it through the night in the shelter. The kindly policeman could not leave the poor woman on the street so easily and cordially offered her a place to stay in his house. He and his wife, like Vanessa, had three young children. When he brought the former bunny home, his wife gladly welcomed the stranger, fed her, and kindly provided her with something old but warm and for such necessities she provided the girl with a cot. The next morning, Vanessa took a shower, changed clothes, ate and tidied herself up a bit. A new, even more difficult journey awaited her, although the policeman's wife had insisted that she stay with them as long as necessary. Vanessa did not want to abuse their hospitality. Warmly thanking her rescuers, she pulled herself together for the trip or left the apartment and walked to the bus stop. Once the first scare had passed, she realized that she could have rented a cheap hostel. He had money on his card, which he had earned in the colony, and he was grateful again for the kind policeman's delicate help. I'll have to thank them later when I can. He thought about it and put it on his mental list of priorities. At last, the bus arrived. After paying her fare, Vanessa made her way to someone she hadn't seen in many long years. She was on her way to see her father when Vanessa stepped off the second-to-last bus. Large snowflakes immediately fell on her eyelashes. She looked around and whispered aloud. It had been many, many years since she had seen her own father, but she remembered exactly where he lived. After her divorce, my mother managed to keep the apartment for herself, and my father had no choice but to move out of town. Her parents, now deceased, had a large and cozy country house. That, at least, was how Vanessa remembered it. As a child, she had loved to spend her vacations here. But after the death of the elders, the family completely abandoned the plot. But since Maria left her ex-husband homeless, the man had to move to live in the city. Or business, he looked and moved on the usual route, the way to this house he remembered by heart. He walked along the snow-covered path, from time to time, almost fell on the slippery turns, on the high snowdrifts. The frost bit into her cheeks, her hands were slowly beginning to fail her. But Vanessa had no intention of stopping, for her father was her last hope. She didn't know how he would react to her sudden appearance. She didn't know if her father would remember her. She didn't even know if he still lived here. And if he did, her thoughts immediately began to race through her mother's words, he doesn't want you. He doesn't want to talk to you. But maybe she had already changed her mind. After all, Vanessa was no longer that little girl. She was an adult and independent. What if she had another family long ago? Or would she still find a place for her daughter who had problems with such contradictory thoughts? Vanessa was approaching the area she needed, and finally the roof of a familiar house came into view in the distance. A sea wind approached, conquered with renewed vigor. A real blizzard seemed to be approaching, or the faith of friends. Neck to neck stood in front of his father's property and scrutinized the shaft. The house seemed to look much better than she remembered, or wasn't sure, and she watched the fence, figuring out how to get in. Vanessa remembered the old village fences as low, rickety, barely holding a line. 
Now, however, in front of her was a tall, blank packet fence on brick pillars, and it was no longer easy to get into the parking lot. I was looking at the door. Yes. Luckily, he found the doorbell. Hesitantly, he pressed the button and backed up a couple of steps. He looked around again. Would it open? I wondered if Vanessa would remember me. Finally, I heard the crunch of snow under the feet of a man walking. It was clear that someone was approaching the door. Vanessa's heart froze and the door opened. A tall, stooped old man appeared through the door. His head was erect. Deep wrinkles under his eyes betrayed solid age, and he looked longingly at her father. He looked nothing like she remembered him. Dad, it's me. Vanessa. Will you let me in? The woman replied hopefully. She took a step forward, but she was too shy to approach her father. Her mother's last behavior had left a terrible mark on her. Vanessa, she was surprised. Daughter, is it really you? You recognized me, Dad. Vanessa smiled with tears in her eyes. How could you not recognize your own son? Come in, sweetheart, how I've missed you. Oliver. Vanessa's father held out his hand and gestured for her to enter and Alia hesitantly stepped onto the property. She looked around. The path to the house was perfectly cleared by pure Russian apple trees. The white snow lay beautifully. She followed her father, entering the house and her hands trembled slightly, nodding excitedly at what could be expected of him. After so many years, so many betrayals, or was it that she could no longer trust anyone? They entered the house and the face immediately promised cozy, homey warmth from the open fireplace. The cozy living room was soothing, and Vanessa immediately wanted to collapse on the couch. Forgetting about everything in the world, she took off her snowshoes. Her father immediately provided her with soft, large, oversized slippers. He took off her jacket, grabbed her by the shoulders, and finally looked her over from head to toe. Vanessa, my child, is it really you? He asked again, and in the corners of his eyes froze tears of happiness. I'm a daddy, you won't throw me out. Vanessa asked uncertainly, shyly, averting her gaze. What are you talking about? He looked worriedly at his daughter. How can you throw your daughter out? Come on, hurry up. Am I glad to see you? I confess I thought you had forgotten your father. With these words, Oliver dragged the girl with him. He sat her down at the big wooden table and began to run around the kitchen. He put the kettle on the gas stove, took several snacks out of the refrigerator. I'm so glad to see you, he repeated over and over. I never dreamed I could look at you just one more time. Vanessa sat on the kitchen couch, tucking in her father's frozen legs. She took the mug with something warm from his hands and couldn't start a conversation. Dad, but you didn't want to see me, she said quietly. And there was a lump in his throat. A lump? You've left us. What's the surprise? A teaspoon slipped from his hand with a clink. I did. What are you saying? What else am I supposed to say? Mom told me everything, how you left us, how you found another woman, how you never wanted to see me again, how you refused to pay alimony. She turned away from her father's surprised gaze. I would never have come to you just like that. I have nowhere else to go. She sulked apologetically. Vanessa, what nonsense are you talking? He was really surprised by his daughter's words. I asked for a divorce first, but I was divorcing your mother. Honey, not you. And I didn't have any other woman at that time. He shrugged in bewilderment. Every one of those days during all the long years we were separated, I thought about how my daughter was doing. Every day I kept trying to see her. He fell silent, biting his lip. Your mother, she is a peculiar woman. You can't imagine how bitterly Vanessa replied. Wait, I do not understand anything. Why did you get divorced? You see, at some point with Masha, with your mom it became simply impossible to live. I remember one day I came home after work. You were just a child, and she, she started yelling at me, accusing me of cheating on her, although I never cheated on her. I swear. And then she said she didn't want to live with me anymore. That day I felt it in my bones. Something had happened, something had changed. From that day on, I was a different person, angry, cynical. She wasn't the same woman I married. What are you talking about? What happened? Or did she step forward with interest? It seemed to her that her mother had always been as she knew her. 
what did her father mean by that? She looked at him intently. You mean you never told him you didn't want to see me? Why didn't you pay alimony then? Did I? The man replied. His eyebrows seemed to run across his forehead in surprise. I always paid. I wrote you letters, gave you presents every holiday. Look at this. The last words reached Vanessa from the new opening between the kitchen and the bedroom. Dad ran into the back of the house, rattling boxes in the distance. Then he returned with an armful of papers. Look, Vanessa incredulously reached out to look at the papers. He really did pay, she observed in surprise. They were bank statements showing that Oliver had been transferring a decent amount of money into Maria's account each month. She took a quick glance at the statements, and then an old letter caught her eye. She recognized her mother's handwriting on those sheets. What was it about? Vanessa asked her father in a low voice. Without waiting for an answer, he began to read the letter. Her eyes widened in surprise. Her mother had written in it, among other swear words and angry accusations against her father. We don't need your credentials and letters. Vanessa said she didn't want to see you or hear from you ever again. She said she didn't want a cheating father. We laughed out loud reading your stupid writings. You never showed up in our lives again, and you made us sick just transferring money to support her. Goodbye. After reading these lines, she looked away from her father. What is this? Asked Vanessa. Did your mother write this to you? Yes. Oliver sank into the chair next to his daughter. I've been trying to get in touch with you for a long time. I could hardly believe that a bright girl like you could say such words. But your mother was adamant. She forbade me to talk to you. And the day I decided to wait for you after school, she found out about it and threw some bullies she knew at me. They beat me up so badly that strangers called an ambulance. Thanks to them. I couldn't reach you, Vanessa. The only thing I could do was wait until you were old enough to make your own decisions. I had a big smile on my face. And now, finally, I have waited. But how have you lived all this time? You tell me. Wait, wait, wait. Or did you shake your head? I mean, all this time, mom wouldn't let me see you and lied to me about child support. She lied to me about you not wanting to see me. And she lied to you about me not wanting to see you. But why would she do that? The girl asked in surprise. Your mother is lovely. She's changed a lot. I don't know what exactly has happened to her, but it's a fact. She's such a good person now that it's dangerous to confront her. I did my best and stepped aside. I'm sorry you had to go through all that time thinking that your own father abandoned you. I didn't mean for that to happen. Why are you so calm about all this? Vanessa was outraged. Aren't you the least bit surprised by this act? It's horrible. Where did he put the alimony money? We lived pretty poor after his divorce. Every time I asked him to buy me something when I was a kid, he would yell at me that my father didn't pay child support and there was no money. You realize I almost hated you, or did you jump out of your chair? Before, I wouldn't have been able to believe that your mother was really capable of something like that. But now, why would you say something? She shouted at her father, unable to stand his calmness any longer. Your mother is like that, there's no controlling her. Forgive me again for everything. The father took his daughter's hands and looked her in the eyes. Have you grown so much? Tell me how your life has been going. Vanessa, helpless, leaned back in her chair. Oh, Daddy, I don't know where to begin. That night, Vanessa again told her father everything that had happened to her over the years. She told him about her childhood, how she had fallen in love with Andrew, and how mean he had been to cheat on her. She told him about Kelly and Oliver was very surprised at her behavior, because he remembered her as a child. Vanessa told him all about her incarceration in the women's colony, about life in prison, how she suddenly discovered she was pregnant, and how she barely survived. She gave birth to the triple Anya. Oliver listened to his daughter and could not believe all that such a young woman had to go through. She told how her mother supposedly didn't recognize her, how she had left the apartment. At the end of the story it seemed that the father's already gray eyebrows had turned even paler. He said quietly, my poor child. How sorry I am that I could not keep you safe. And she turned away from her father, hiding the tears. Wasn't it your fault? It was Andrew, her mother, and Kelly. They set me up. Oliver frowned. You met Andrew's mother on the bus. 
I thought, from what you told me, that he didn't want to hurt you. Yeah, well, he got out of it. If he hadn't, he wouldn't have testified against me. I'm pretty sure she was the anonymous witness. That's what the coroner told me. The identity of the witness is kept confidential in the interest of the investigation. Who else could have done it? I don't know, honey, but I think this woman can be trusted. Dad got up from the chair he'd been sitting in. Well, morning is morning. I'll get your room ready for you now. You go to bed. Tomorrow you and I will go get my granddaughters. They must not live in an orphanage as long as he lives, so the girls will be here with us. O looked at her father gratefully. Thank you, Dad. She stood up and followed her father up to the second floor. There Oliver prepared for Vanessa her old room, where she had slept as a child, and she fell asleep. As soon as her head touched the pillow, the night passed peacefully. Her last thought was my God, I can't believe I'm going to pick up my daughters tomorrow. Vanessa stepped out of the car. The bright sunlight immediately hit her eyes and the frost got into her bones. She was back in the place where she had spent two whole years of her life, back at the front door of the women's colony. But now the reason for being here was much more cheerful and a faint smile. The frost seemed to freeze on her face. The impending encounter with the children could only lift her spirits. She passed through the security point, was issued the necessary pass, and at the entrance to the children's building was immediately greeted by the prison nanny. As all the bunnies who had children here jokingly called this kind woman. Vanessa opened her arms to give her a hug. You take care of the girls. You found a good place for them. Yes, Vanessa replied with pride in her voice. I reconciled with my father. He has his own big house and we're going to live. It will be fine. I'll be able to raise my kids. That's great. Nanny nodded happily. What about the job? Or are you ashamed? Not yet, but I'll find one soon. I'll do what I can for the children. I'll do what I can. I understand. You're doing great. Good luck, child. And she was taken inside the walls of the orphanage. And there she finally saw her own children. The little ones were as happy to see their mom as their mom was happy to see them. She gathered up all the baby things that had been assigned to Vanessa at the prison, picked up the girls and left there, hoping sincerely that it was for good. Oliver waited for them by the car, not hiding his impatience. My God, who do we have here? Look at the cuties. While he was getting to know his granddaughters, Vanessa looked at them with undisguised happiness. Now she had a family again. In this world, a father who gave them shelter and three daughters. What's your hurry, mom? Asked a cheerful female voice from behind. Or did she turn sharply? Emily? Ella shouted, unable to believe her happiness. They let you out. But how? So sardonically, laughing, replied the parole officer friend, of course, how else my lawyer helped. And what secrets did you have for me? Vanessa said thoughtfully, already hugging her friend. Where are you going now? Emily winked cheerfully. Stay out of adult things. Honey, you'd better introduce me to your father. So they drove into town together. All the way they chatted and laughed told each other the latest news and the time on the road flew by. When Vanessa said goodbye, she left Emily her new address and made her promise to come visit her. Days passed and Vanessa began to feel a taste for life again. Together with her daughters, they finally moved in with their father and grandfather, and Oliver gave them the entire second floor. He also bought cribs for his granddaughters, the necessary clothes, and provided them with food and anything else they needed. Oliver had his own small grocery store in town. Therefore, the man had a lot of free time. He spent all his weekends and free time with his granddaughters. This freed his mother from some of the routine worries. Vanessa tried to recover little by little and start her life from scratch. She raised the children, took care of the household and often helped her father in his business, filling in from time to time for the sales girls working at Oliver's. Life went on as usual, but memories of her prison job kept Vanessa busy. Apparently, she was the only one of the inmates who really enjoyed the monotonous job. So Vanessa had a new idea. She decided that she should train professionally and become a professional seamstress, maybe even a fashion designer. She already had experience, desire, and talent. Even those rough things that Vanessa sewed when she was still in the colony came out of her excellent quality the day she decided to turn her dream into reality. 
she signed up for an interview at the nearest sewing house. But here another cruel disappointment awaited the young woman because of her criminal record. She was not willing to accept even such an unskilled job, or she tried not to give up. But again and again she expected another refusal, no one wanted to get in touch with a former offender, and did not try by all means. She did not want to give up her favorite business half-heartedly. But unfortunately, all attempts were in vain. She never managed to find a job. One night, after receiving another rejection, the sad Vanessa returned home. How are you? Asked the girl's father, distracted by playing with the girls. Did you get caught? No, in a heartbeat, she replied, biting her lip, or herself ashamed that she had to serve time in prison, mostly for nothing. Bitter resentment pounced on her with renewed vigor. No one will accept me. No one wants me, he shouted. I don't judge them. I mean, really, who needs it? Honey, don't worry. If they don't take you in one place, they're sure to take you in another. The man got up and handed little Helen to his daughter. It's not worth your while to cry. Daddy, I'm not going anywhere. Just accept it. Everyone thinks I'm a criminal. How much do I hate all this? It's not my fault. Of course it isn't. The important thing is that you know that. Don't worry about it. There's enough money for everyone. She has a big smile on her face. That's how she encourages her daughter. And you didn't think you could work by yourself. I'll buy you a machine, fabric, thread, everything you need, and you can sew at home. And then we'll display the finished garments in my store. Dad, you have a grocery store. And an industrial machine costs a lot of money. Forget it. I'll go wherever they take me, Vanessa replied with nostalgia in her voice. At the same time, the girls were placed at the feeding tables. And? Vanessa asked the man sincerely. We are in the countryside, especially now that it's winter. Well, at least start with warm socks. And you know how to knit too. Let's see how the sails and sails go. She had one lying around. So she rummaged in the nearest closet. Oh, look. Why did you at least try? There's no charge for asking. As they say, I don't know, Vanessa replied quietly. It was a dream come true for her to sell her own handmade and knitted items. But to start now or embarrass me, Dad, you know, I'm offended by something else. I really didn't steal that pendant. Why doesn't anyone believe me? I believe you, Dad replied confidently and was quiet for a long while. Then he wrinkled his nose a little. He asked next. Don't you want to tell Andres that he is going to have children? Vanessa opened her eyes wide in surprise. Andrew? No. The girl replied in a harsh tone. He's not worthy of his own children. Well, honey, he's their biological father. Maybe he should at least know. Do you think the girl's friends wouldn't want to keep in touch with their own father? Vanessa thought deeply. She immediately thought back to her childhood. The times when she missed her father, those days when she watched with envy as the other children at school and their parents were picked up. And her father, she thought then, had disowned her. The memories stung painfully. She definitely wouldn't want that for her daughters. Thinking, she replied, I don't know, Dad, maybe you're right. Of course I'm right. I'm sure you are, he replied. For now do what you want, but remember that sooner or later you will have to meet Andres. Tell him about the girls, talk to him, ask him why he did it. Vanessa and her father were already finishing feeding their daughters when the children, as well as Oliver, had already gone to bed or quietly went to the living room and sat down. In front of the fireplace, she began to knit her first woolen socks to sell. Sateva woke up in the early morning, Vanessa went out into the yard and stopped to look at the plot. The sun had just risen over the horizon and small snowflakes were falling. They seemed to hang motionless in the air. The surface of the brick house was covered with a light layer of snow, and the roads were again covered with a thick layer of snow. Warming up slightly, Vanessa set about clearing the path. Her father's back had been hurting lately, and he was no longer able to do such hard work. When she put the shovel away and looked around again, suddenly he realized that, for the first time in his life, he actually lived in a village, a very normal little village with wild boars occasionally in the area. Many neighbors were raising cows or shoveling snow or lighting the fireplace. I lived a most ordinary and simple life, but a very happy and fulfilled one. 
A warm feeling of gratitude pervaded his whole being. Who knows, had it not been for this incarceration in the colony, would he ever have enjoyed this lifestyle? She would have gone to her father. Disadvantaged by her birth mother, she would have given birth to three wonderful babies. I didn't know what to think. Vanessa was so used to hating everyone and everything that she had completely forgotten how important it was to realize the simple happiness that surrounded her. How important it is to appreciate simple, tasty food and clean water every day. To appreciate your family, to appreciate your freedom, after all. It turned out that even from her imprisonment, she was able to derive obvious benefits for herself. Interrupting her musings with a creak, the front door opened and a distressed Oliver Vanessa appeared in the doorway. He called out to his daughter, what are you doing up so early today? Ellie smiled broadly and went to answer his father's call. I want to work more. Also a little today while the girls are asleep. By the way, has anyone bought me the socks and sweater of hope? She asked and followed her father into the house. Of course I did, the man replied proudly, putting his hand to his sore back. He made an inviting gesture and headed for the kitchen. A boiling kettle was already whistling. The first day your socks and sweater were sold out. The villagers were asking for more. I even promised a lady in the center of the district that you, Sasha, would make her address to order. Really? Wow. Or did you just gleefully splash your hands? If things keep going like this, I'm saving up for a good sewing machine. You'll definitely buy one. Honey, but you should know this. I can give you the money you need, and you can't. Vanessa rudely interrupted her father. I want to earn my own money, you know? Well, all right, all right. The father laughed heartily and placed a steaming cup of fragrant tea in front of his daughter. He squared his back and sat down opposite Vanessa, looking into her eyes. What have you decided about Andrew? Ely took a big sip and raised his eyebrows questioningly. What do you mean, what are you going to tell him about the kids? The father asked his question directly. She raised her eyes to the ceiling, dreamy. Lately Vanessa hadn't realized how she felt about her ex-husband. During the long months she had spent in the colony, she had been so angry, so furious, that she often couldn't contain herself. But what about love? Even in prison, Vanessa clearly understood that behind the anger there were still warm feelings. Behind all that rage and hatred was a small, abandoned, hurt Vanessa. She probably never got to let go of her lover once and for all. After leaving the colony and after Vanessa saw Andrew's car in traffic, she ended up confusing her emotions. On the one hand, she hated him with all her soul because he had set her up, had tricked her on purpose to put her in jail. And on the other hand, it could not be said that Vanessa, being a reasonable person, still loved him. But sometimes she was visited by strange thoughts. What if he wasn't guilty of anything? It was difficult for the young mother to realize where he was hiding the truth. Did she still love her ex-husband, or did she hate him? Was he the one to blame for that setup, or was he himself a victim of circumstances? And that meeting with Betty. What did she mean when she said not to trust anyone? What was she doing in the reform school, as she used to do? There were far more questions than answers, or, come to think of it, answer to her father's perplexed and bewildered look. Yes, I'm willing to meet him. I want to find out who this anonymous witness was. I want to find out why I was treated that way," Vanessa said quietly. Old man, maybe you can find out why they did this to you. When are you going to visit him soon? Really, I want to visit someone else first, Vanessa said in a mysterious tone. Who else? Betty? I'll find out what she was doing in juvie and find out who the man was who set me up. Vanessa stared at the passing building. Holding tightly to the pores of the bus, she couldn't believe that soon she would be able to find out everything. Find out the reason for his imprisonment, find out his motives. She wasn't entirely sure she would meet Betty, she would make it. Her heart pounded in anticipation of the encounter. Thoughts swirled chaotically in her head. Her mind kept throwing out different scenarios. But Vanessa tried with all her might to keep herself under control. Finally, the doors opened and she got off at the stop she needed. She looked around. The neighborhood where her ex-husband had grown up and where Betty lived hadn't changed a bit. She took a deep breath and headed toward the house she was looking for. And with every step, her pulse quickened and her hands shook harder. What will I do if he's not home? 
she asked herself the same question. The day Vanessa and her mother-in-law had accidentally crossed paths on the bus, Betty got off at a completely different location. What if she no longer lived here? Vanessa walked up to the entrance from memory, dialed the intercom code. The door dropped and the girl climbed the stairs, reaching the floor she wanted or wasn't sure, she pressed the buzzer. To her surprise, the door opened instantly and a haggard, tired woman appeared on the threshold. Vanessa, what are you doing here, making no secret of your surprise? She asked, what have you come for? To find out the truth, announced Vanessa. Why did you want my trial? What have I done to upset you so? Whispered Betty discontentedly. She took a quick glance up the stairwell. Then she grabbed Vanessa by the arm and pulled her back. She quickly closed the door to the apartment. Quiet you, why are you shouting all the way down the hall? The woman was indignant. Why? Are you afraid that someone will find out that you have set up your daughter-in-law? Explain immediately. The girl continued to insist. Oh, Vanessa, don't you understand, Betty? Frustrated, she shook her head, let's go to the kitchen. As the women walked to the back of the floor and sat down at the table, Andrew's mother took a long time to decide to start this conversation. She wrung her hands. The old woman's gaze kept wandering. She couldn't gather her strength and look her in the eye either. Finally, he exhaled deeply. She exhaled the first words out of Vanessa's mouth. Believe me, it's not what it looks like. At first glance, it is much more complicated than that. The woman turned away guiltily, looking out the window with her wandering gaze. I understand that you want to know why our family has treated you this way, but, but I won't be able to give you an answer. Not even with my eyes wide open. What does that mean? A blue crown protruded from her forehead, indignant. You realize what I've been through, don't you? I've been in jail for nothing, and it's hard for you to give me a reason. I thought you and I had always had a good relationship. Have you? No, 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 no. Betty yelled at me. I've always treated you well, and I'm treating you right now. There was no other way. Oh my God. Vanessa jumped to her feet. Stop talking in riddles. Why did you testify against me? Why did you set me up? Do I know what you mean? The woman replied. But I didn't give that testimony. It certainly wasn't me. Then who was it? Or did you approach your mother-in-law? Her eyes flashed with anger. Tell me, who is this anonymous witness? I can't tell you. I can't tell you. She turned away again, as if afraid to cross an enraged Vanessa and her gaze. Just know that it wasn't me. I tried to help you, but circumstances got the better of me. Then who was who? Andrew? It was him. No, darling, of course it wasn't. I know you won't believe me, but Andrew never meant to hurt you. He always loved you. Vanessa laughed nervously. Come on. When love goes to jail, you don't get custody. That's just the way it is. But believe me, Andrew had nothing to do with it either. At last, she looked Vanessa closely in the eye. Remember what I told you. Think, who do you trust? That's all I can say. O closed her eyes, trying not to burst out screaming again. All right, what were you doing at the women's colony? At least answer that. Betty thought long and hard before saying anything, tapping her fingers nervously on the table, frowning. Okay, I'll answer, said the woman quietly. I, like you, have been condemned. Only I, unlike you, have been allowed to stay at home under house arrest, but my movements are restricted. In addition, I have been assigned community service. There is a departmental factory not far from the colony. That is where I am forced to work. Fate has not only treated you badly, but also you. Why? Or did you just close your eyes in surprise? What have you done? That's just it. Honey, I'm not regretting anything. You and I got into a terrible mess. You got away with it. That's why I don't want to answer you. I don't want you to get involved in this again. In a situation like this, not knowing is the best thing to do. Yes, you had to spend time in prison. But now you're free. Forget about it all. Move on with your life. That's easy to say, Celia resented it. My life is ruined. I can't get a job because of my criminal record. My mother kicked me out of the house, and my kids are kids. What kids? Betty asked in surprise. And wait, Mom. Your mother kicked you out of the house? 
Where do you live? Vanessa looked intently at her former mother-in-law and suddenly felt like getting even. She waved her hand. I'm not going to tell you anything. It's up to you. You haven't answered my questions. And I won't answer yours or Betty's. Wasn't it six months after you gave birth that you got out of prison? Did you give birth in prison? My God, did I become a grandmother? Betty's eyes lit up with happiness. Her lips stretched into a smile. Why didn't you say so from the beginning? I have a grandson or granddaughter, Betty. Granddaughter. I had triplets. Vanessa replied calmly. She was slightly embarrassed by her earlier behavior and went back to sitting at the kitchen table. Yes, my mother threw me out and kicked me out of the apartment. I reconciled with my father and now my daughters and I live with him. Why were you surprised when I said mom, were you embarrassed? No, not at all. Forgetting that he cleared his granddaughter's throat means three times as much. How many things have you been through? When I can know them, when you can give me answers to my questions, Vanessa replied casually, rising from her seat. She left the apartment without waiting for her ex-mother-in-law's answer. She ran out of the house in a hurry. She didn't want to be there a second longer, nor did she know what to think. Once again, she had even more questions. What was Betty talking about? Why was she being judged? What was she hiding? Was Andrew really not to blame? Not wanting to think about what had happened anymore, Vanessa got on the bus and headed to the bus station to catch one to take her to her neighborhood. As it turned out, she was no closer to solving the mystery. But I don't know, Oliver said thoughtfully. I don't think she's lying. Then why isn't she telling the truth, Dad, if she has nothing to hide? Vanessa asked her father. That evening, when the girls were tucked up in their crib, Oliver and Vanessa sat together in the living room. In front of the fireplace, Vanessa was knitting a warm sweater for one of her daughters, while her father was arming himself with the right tools and fixing a broken clock. He replied to his daughter, Sometimes circumstances are stronger, don't I know that? What's going on out there, I don't understand. If Andrew's not to blame, is Kelly the one keeping everyone in fear? It's absurd. It's not absurd. Do you know how twisted people can be? Look at your mother. You'll say the same thing. Or a grudging chuckle. What's she got to do with it? It's not like she's intimidated. Grandma, do you really think Betty's afraid of Kelly? Honey, I don't think anything. I'm just guessing. We'll never know. Yeah, I think you should listen to this woman. Payback never did anyone any good. Dad resented Vanessa. They ruined my whole life. How can I forget that and get on with my life? I want to find out who did this. All right, all right. It's up to you, Oliver replied calmly and deflected the subject in another direction. So you went to see Andrew. He already knows he's a father. No, no, I didn't. And Betty turned away the spokes and cocked her head to one side. Talking to Betty, you made me go to his house too. Seeing the look of satisfaction on that bitch Alina's face, I didn't want that. And I think her mother will tell her herself. And if they're not in touch anymore, then what? No, you have to tell her. And Kelly is, well, what can you do? Don't worry about her for a second. She's not worth it. How come they don't communicate? Vanessa was shocked. She was so protective of him, so dismissive. Screaming that it wasn't her fault he had a deadline. Do you think she would have defended him if they weren't in contact? I think they're doing well. You can't know for sure. You have to go and see for yourself. Talk to Andrew and let the situation go. That's what Vasilisa said. Live your life, Oliver urged his daughter. Vanessa wondered if it was Andrew who was keeping her mother in fear. Is that why she was talking about him like that? What if Andrew is the anonymous witness? It could be anything. Betty. Go see him now and talk to him from the waist up. That said, Vanessa resumed her knitting. The rest of the afternoon passed quietly. The family did not return to this conversation. With quiet, uncertain steps, spring was approaching, the snowdrifts were melting, leaving giant puddles, and all of nature was preparing to wake up, and Vanessa's work did not stop. In just a few months, she had built up a whole portfolio of customers. Orders poured into the craftswoman's hands like springtime streams. Life was improving little by little. Vanessa's daughters were growing up and making her and their grandfather happy. Oliver worked in his store. Vanessa herself was gradually recovering. 
She worked for her own pleasure and raised her daughters with passion. You could say that Vanessa's life was almost perfect if it weren't for one small detail. She could not forget what had happened to her. Literally every night Vanessa didn't sleep for a long time, all the while dribbling and thinking about how unfairly she had been treated. And who was to blame? It turned out that Vanessa couldn't take Betty Michaelovna's advice, and once again, decided to find out what was keeping her awake at night. She pulled herself together and left her children in the company of their loving grandfather. O returned to the city with the purpose of seeing Andrew. She drove to the house where she had lived for those years. As soon as Andrew turned 18, his parents bought him a separate apartment and he, of course, immediately invited his girlfriend to live with him. The young people lived together. And if someone had told them, then how would be their future life? To remember the past, to believe in all the recent events was unbearably difficult, even impossible. Approaching the house, Vanessa raised her head, squinting against the bright sun. She quickly found the balcony of Andrew's apartment and nostalgia returned to her with renewed vigor. She remembered how, when she had moved in with her fiancé, she had started a greenhouse on her balcony, how she had gone across town to buy another flower. Now the balcony was empty, and now she lived there with annoyance, Vanessa had observed to herself. She couldn't get it through her head. Why had Andrew abandoned her so easily? How could he have left the one he had once loved more than life? Why had he changed her for another in an instant? Vanessa made her way to the entrance and, without thinking, rang the doorbell. After her conversation with Betty, she didn't know what to expect. Andrew opened the door. Hello, stunned she looked at Vanessa. She said hello. Finally seeing Andrew after a long pause, Vanessa immediately realized something was wrong with him. Panic in her eyes. It looked like he was the one being held prisoner and not Vanessa. She lifted her chin proudly. Why? He asked instead of waving. If you fell out of love with me, why didn't you leave me? Why did you have to ruin my whole life like that? Andrew lowered his eyes. Vanessa, you shouldn't have come here. Why should I? The girl was outraged. What secrets do you and your mother have? How many times? At least explain everything. Have a conscience, after all. Andrew raised his eyebrows in surprise. Have you seen your mother? How is she? What's wrong with her now? He turned around peering down at the floor and took a step forward, stepping out into the hallway. What has she told you? He asked, lowering his voice. No, answers first. Or did she point the finger at her ex-husband? I'm sick of all this. I just want to know why I've been treated like this. Andrew, he scratched his ear uncertainly. You'll find out, I promise. Just give me some time. Time for what? What do you need time for? What's going on here? Vanessa almost shouted, why did you testify against me? I didn't. Andrew shouted, and immediately embarrassed by his own emotionality. And believe me, your incarceration was the only way out for us. Do you even know what you're talking about? Have you ever been to Juvie? Do you think it's paradise? No, I haven't. I was faced with such a choice that your incarceration was the lesser of evils. Those people. What people? Vanessa interrupted. Who are you talking about? Those people could have done much worse things to you. I still don't know who sent them. But it's very dangerous to mess with them. Andrew, like a frightened child, turned at every noise. His voice was calm. It was evident that he was very frightened. He lowered his voice. You shouldn't be here. Go away. Please go away. I'll get back to you later. When the sharp sound of the door opening prevented the man from finishing that sentence, Kelly appeared in the doorway. What people? She said in an unpleasant voice. What are you doing here? Vanessa took a menacing step forward, looking sternly into her former friend's eyes. Vanessa was no longer the shy girl who had cursed at every loud word a couple of years ago. Prison had taught Vanessa. Life had taught her not to be afraid to look her enemy straight in the eye. Seeing her former friend's confident gaze, Kelly visibly stiffened, but tried not to show it. She rephrased her question, why did you come here? To look you in the eye, Vanessa said plainly, why did you do this to me? That you were afraid Andrew wouldn't last long. If I'm still free, Kelly seethed, losing her self-control. How dare you, she screamed. Andrew was never yours. 
the ex-husband, who had been standing beside her the whole time, shot a meaningful glance at Vanessa and turned to Kelly. Don't be nervous. Shall we go inside? No, snapped an already enraged Kelly and hurled, Vanessa, you're a dirty thief. You got what you deserve. Thieves should be in jail. It's not your pendant, it's Andrew's family pendant. You had nothing to do with it, you just slandered me. And you were my best friend. Do you know how they treat people like you in juvie? Or did you just squint? Is Kelly getting nervous? I don't know and I don't want to know. That's the kind of knowledge I'll never need. We'll see about that. Vanessa replied firmly and turned and walked away. On the way home, Vanessa couldn't stop thinking about Andrew's words, what kind of people he was talking about and why he had stopped communicating with her mother, and about Alina's strange behavior. All nervous and jittery. What could be going on, the girl thought. Andrew said that jail was the lesser of evils. What could be worse than jail? She thought deeply about that question. By the time she was walking home, the hair on the back of her head seemed to stand on end. His blood froze in his veins and his heart skipped a beat. He seemed to realize what Andrew meant. What could be worse than prison? Death. The girl walked the rest of the way, glancing nervously around. Betty was right. She shouldn't have gone in there. A cold, clammy sweat ran down her back with her eyes closed in fear. He had never told her about the children, had he? Vanessa was completely confused by all the recent events. She burst into the house like she was being chased by dogs, bolted the gate, and ran into the foyer, ripping off her shoes and jacket. Dad called Oliver and hurried into the living room and then into the kitchen. Vanessa froze in surprise. Her father, smiling cordially, was sitting in the company of a portly, red-haired woman. Emily shouted to Vanessa and was instantly in her friend's arms. Good to see you. I've been waiting for you. Hi. It was obvious that Emily was glad to see you too. How was your trip? Vanessa sighed nervously. Dad told you everything. Yes, you don't have to tell me the latest news. Emily smiled softly. Yes, I'm already in the loop, not Tommy. What did Andrew say? Vanessa sank back. The look that actually gave didn't say anything. She briefly recounted today's events to Emily and Dad. And they both collapsed into the arms of the old couch. As always, more questions arose. Who were these dangerous people? Why was jail the lesser of evils? I don't understand anything at all. Who was the anonymous witness? The moment Vanessa mentioned the mystery witness, Emily and her father's faces visibly changed. Emily and her father's faces visibly changed, or asked in surprise, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? She looked worriedly from her father to her friend Vanessa. Emily got up from the table and approached the girl, taking her hand. I came to see you for a reason. I learned something, that or looked interested. What are you talking about? Remember when we were in juvie and I promised to help you with your case, Emily asked. Of course I remember. Tell me what you found out, isn't it intriguing? Don't ask me how, but I was able to get into the files and found out who that anonymous witness was. I know who gave that testimony that got you thrown in jail. Emily exhaled heavily, not breaking eye contact with her friend, or burning with curiosity. Who is he? Who? Talking. And already she gripped the woman's arm tightly. Or was it her mother? How? Or was her whole life flashing before her eyes? He knew his mother was far from being a gift, and what his father had told him didn't fit the image of the perfect mother. But to send her own son to prison knowing it wasn't her fault. Vanessa couldn't believe what she was hearing. Are you sure? She asked quietly. Maria was the witness. It was she who told in color how she saw you hide and steal the toilet, the pendant, I'm sorry, I really don't know how to support you. Emily went down to the palace, holding her hands tightly. I can't imagine how anyone could do that to their own daughter. I can't either. Vanessa spoke softly. She looked at Oliver. Dad, did you know? I just found out now from Emily, the man replied. I'm shocked, too. I knew Maria would frame anyone but you. I don't know what to think. Why would he do that? Thoughtfully. As if to himself, asked the older man. I don't know, Vanessa replied quietly. But I will find out. This cannot go unpunished. He must answer for it. With these words, Vanessa got up and ran out of the kitchen. 
She went upstairs to her daughter's room. How can this be? thought Vanessa and immediately analyzed the situation with herself. Could she have incriminated her daughter? Never and never in her life. Whether after the father's story or definitely changed her opinion about her mother. But still she tried to understand her. But now Vanessa realized that she now refused to relate to her. She had finally figured out who was involved in the setup. She had figured it out and was ready to get revenge. The next day, Vanessa traveled to the city. She was overcome with anger, for the pain of her own mother's betrayal was unrelenting. Once again, she went to confront the relationship. True, she now had some information at her disposal. After reflecting on previous dialogues, Vanessa decided to prepare herself thoroughly. After consulting with her father and Emily, who was staying with them for a few days, Vanessa went to her mother's house for a reason. This time she had an ace up her sleeve. Once all the equipment was checked and a couple of important calls were made, Vanessa entered the house with a confident stride. She went upstairs and immediately drummed on the front door. Open up, she shouted, sure that her mother was already home. I know you're here. Oh, spared no effort. She knocked as if her life depended on the force of those knocks. Until a few hours ago, thanks to Emily's programmer, the women had managed to find out that Maria had returned to the apartment in the early hours of the morning. She had not left the house again. So there was no doubt. The traitor. I heard a knock at the door. After a few long minutes, the door opened ajar and Maria peeked through the crack, her face covered in sweat. Why are you sad? He poked me. Stop embarrassing me in front of the neighbors, or he did. Now was not the time to be ceremonious. When the door opened, he quickly stuck his foot in. Her huge, sturdy shoes prevented her mother from slamming the door shut, and Vanessa was able to force her way in. The frightened mother backed up a couple of steps. Is this how prison changes people? You go crazy. You throw yourself at your own mother. Now you remember me? Yes, Vanessa asked with a smirk. She had taken a quick look around. The apartment had been beautifully renovated. Marble paneling, luxurious period furniture had just broken her eyes Oh, asked where the money had come from mom. Did you really get such a bargain for framing your own daughter? Maria was stunned. How do you talk to your mother? She shouted. Get out of here or I'll call the police again. Oh, stepped forward. Are you my mother? In a low, threatening voice, she said. It's not you and I reject you. I know everything. Just tell me why you wanted to do this. And what do you know? Maria snorted. There was no trace of the recent fear left. Well, I didn't expect you to guess, did I? I've always had you. Answer me, why? Why did you do it? Or did you take it a step further with your mother? Why? 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 I repeated after my daughter. Because you were of no use to her. Her eyes flashed with madness. Who did you marry? Your father, I suppose. You wouldn't have agreed to steal that pendant, would you? Neither would I. So I had to get rid of you, I'm sorry. So you admit you set me up. I admit to perjury. Vanessa asked, raising her voice. Oh, this is a dead end. The woman laughed, of course it is. You're nothing but trouble. That's Kelly. I wish she was my daughter. I saw potential in her when she was a kid. She'd do anything to get what she wanted. It's not like you're a wimp. Did you put me in jail for some dangling and put Kelly up to it? Or did you wonder again, even though you vowed not to wonder about anything anymore? What kind of people put you up to it? Was it Andrew's mother? It was you. Who else? Of course it was me, I laughed with renewed vigor. When you and Kelly were very young, thanks to Kelly herself, I made a useful friendship. Her uncle was out of jail at the time. He was very famous in the world of thieves. He had his eye on me right away and introduced me to his rooftops. I always knew the good life wasn't for me. And your boring father was always boring. Then I heard about the pendant, which was legendary among thieves. We knew it belonged to some family in our village, but we didn't know to whom. I divorced your father. And I started dating my Zach. The woman smiled almost sweetly. He is an incredibly interesting man. He has such a dangerous and interesting life with all of them. Maria told it all with undisguised pride. Vanessa felt chills. She couldn't believe that this strange foreign woman was her own mother. Vanessa asked softly, 
So you contacted the criminals and instigated them to steal the pendant. But why didn't you get rid of me before you let me live with my father? What a fool you are, she shook her head. Your father paid good alimony. With that money, I helped my man Zach get back on his feet when he needed it. And then, then you managed to do some good yourself. Don't look so surprised. You grew up and fell in love with that Andrew Tonto of yours. I still remember you dreaming about a mysterious pendant you passed around. What was my surprise when I realized it was that very jewel? Since you were 16, we have been preparing for this case. Stealing her would have been a real mistake. It was too notorious, so we had to play it safe. How? Did you get Kelly to seduce Andrew? Did Vanessa feel like she was going to puke with disgust? No, Kelly was up to her neck without my help. The crazy lady let out a disgusted giggle. Because of her coming of age, I made a deal with her. I help her get rid of you, and she seduces Andrew and keeps the pendant. We split the money, and it's all about the money. How is that possible? Vanessa said quietly. Of course it is. Do you have any idea how much this thing is worth? Zach's goons intimidated Betty and Andrew. She fought back hard enough to defend you in court, but Andrew had to be shut down too. He was given a choice between you going to jail or having a terrible car accident. Of course, he agreed to stay out of it to keep you alive. That idiot loves you. I don't know why, really. Andrew cheated on me at my wedding. He kissed Kelly. What kind of love is that? Bitter. Vanessa smiled. I don't think you can fake that. Maria laughed wickedly. One can know all the right methods. They must have slipped something into him. That's why the guy lost his mind. And forcing him to marry the line wasn't hard. The threat of death of loved ones can accomplish a lot. Maria said mockingly. And immediately threw her daughter a suspicious look. Who may you be paroled? So soon, Ub. You were always a guy. You got six years. That should have been enough time for us to finish all our old business here and go overseas. And here you are, hello, surprise. Why can't you stay in one place? What are you doing? Where don't you belong? You said Andrew threatened to kill me, said Vanessa in a low, changed voice. If I had refused your terms anyway, would you really have killed me? Maria smiled predatorily and looked at her daughter with completely crazed, glassy eyes. Why did he hesitate? He took a quick step into the kitchen and returned holding a large kitchen knife. I told you to stay out of it. I didn't pretend not to remember you. Why did you choose your own destiny? Move. Are you under arrest? Shouted one of the agents. Finally, we have a lead on this OCG. Shortly after, the police officers Vanessa already knew entered the room. One of them was the cop who didn't leave the poor girl in trouble. And with him, police captain Benjamin. In person. Or did she smile gratefully at the men? Thank you for believing me, she said. Thank you, the captain replied. You've helped us find dangerous criminals we haven't been able to catch for years. You deserve all the respect you can get. And about the wrongful conviction, we will provide you with a lawyer, the case will be reconsidered, the conviction will be dismissed, and the state will compensate you for moral damages. An officer from the police station interrupted the conversation. When I came here for a call, I immediately realized that something was wrong. It's good that you called me Vanessa. People like her should be behind bars. That's for sure, Vanessa summed up. Before going to her mother's house, she had a long consultation with Emily. She had suggested the excellent option of contacting a policeman she knew. Either that or exchange phone numbers with him and offer him a deal. Vanessa arrived at the police station and in her concealed clothing, a listening device. She deliberately turned to her mother with the intention of getting as much information out of her as possible. And it was no coincidence that he asked Maria so many questions. At that point, the police department listened to the entire conversation and recorded it for evidence in court. Thus, Maria was looking at a very good conviction, framing not only herself, but also Kelly and her criminal uncle. Betty finally discovered the truth. I hope we can get to the rest of the OCG, Vanessa said. The mobsters should be in jail. We'll do what we can, Captain Benjamin told her. Don't worry. Maria's case turned out to be so high profile that it was the talk of the town for several more months. 
The police had managed to track down the entire criminal gang he was talking about, and each of its members got what they deserved. Maria herself, as well as Kelly and her uncle Zach received solid sentences. It turned out that on their account, not only this crime, but something worse. The court passed sentence. Vanessa acknowledged her mistake and was paid a large sum for moral damages. With the money received, she was able to fulfill his dream, took out a loan, bought a plot of land on the outskirts of the city, built on it a building and opened her sewing house. In a few years, her business grew with branches, and she became a famous fashion designer. Now the whole city wore Vanessa's clothes. That's how she named her salon. This whole story taught Vanessa not to judge a person by their past. After all, as practice shows, an ex-convict can be much more human than a good housewife. Vanessa herself was always happy to employ women who had left the colony. She paid no attention to their past, but gave them all a new chance to find themselves in this life. A few months after her mother's arrest, Vanessa reconciled with Andrew. It turned out that her intuition did not fail her, and the ex-husband turned out to be completely blameless. When Andrew found out about his daughters, he was happier than ever. Our dreams had come true. She screamed with joy, throwing up one after another, the little ones emitting with delight. Vanessa and the children moved into Andrew's apartment, there he took up his old hobby again on the spacious balcony and set up a real greenhouse. Oliver's life didn't stop either. He was so attracted to the kind, intelligent, and decent Emily that he began to court her. After a few months, the woman surrendered to the mercy of the victor. Thus a new happy couple was formed. Having got rid of Maria, the whole family breathed a sigh of relief, and Betty could once again have a child and a normal life. After all, both Maria and Betty had been charged as accomplices in the robbery. And Vanessa no longer held a grudge against anyone. She became more understanding and tolerant. No matter how unfair her life had been at first, but in the end she put everything and everyone in their rightful place.